Hi, it's Katrina. Who killed the Red Baron? Before the time of jet engines and Kevlar, planes were pretty much wood and fabric during World War I. Flying technology was pretty new and definitely not easy during wartime. This was a time when winning 20 aerial dogfights would guarantee a pilot would go down in history as a legend of the skies. The bloody Red Baron of Germany was credited with downing 80 enemy aircraft. The Baron went down in history as the greatest pilot of all time from either side of the war. On April 21, 1918, the Red Baron and his squadron attacked a formation of planes being flown by British and Canadian pilots in France. The Baron's blood-red triplane was soon on the tail of Canadian amateur pilot Lieutenant Wilfred May. The chase caught the attention of Canadian squadron commander Captain Arthur Roy Brown, who tried to help. The Red Baron made a mistake and flew too far behind enemy lines. Brown closed in on him and opened fire. The planes flew over an Australian machine gun unit on the ground who also opened fire. The German ace swerved to avoid one attack when from another angle a bullet struck him in the chest, severely damaging his heart and lungs. Somehow he mustered the courage to land his plane on the side of the road near Soleil Le Sac, but by the time the Australian troops reached him, the Red Baron was dead, shot by that single bullet. Military historians often give Brown credit for shooting down the Red Baron. Others argue it was an Australian rifleman on the ground who delivered the fatal blow. To this day, nobody knows who killed the Red Baron. Canadian Captain Arthur Roy Brown admitted that he didn't see who killed him, and beyond that never spoke much about the incident. Various theories have narrowed down the likely shooter to three different Australian gunners, with many pointing towards Sergeant Cedric Popkin, who was in an appropriate position to shoot the Red Baron based on the angle of the bullet that hit him. The Red Baron's unsound state of mind was also called into question. For such an experienced and skilled pilot, he flew dangerously low over enemy territory and became overly fixated on his target. He may have been suffering brain damage from a recent injury, leading to what seemed like a lack of judgment compared to his usual skill in decision-making. Zabrina Crew's Disappearance in October 1917, the British sailing barge Zabrina left Cornwall for France with a cargo of coal under the command of a man named Captain Martin. The trip should have taken around 30 hours, but the vessel failed to arrive at its destination. French units found it two days later on Rosal Point south of Cherbourg, France, where it had run aground. The Zabrina appeared unharmed, but the crew was nowhere to be found. There were no outward signs of what might have gone wrong. The lifeboat was still in place, the galley fire was burning, and someone set the dinner table for five people. The crew's clothing and belongings were still on board, along with the ship's logbook, which contained no suspicious entries. There are many theories about what could have happened to the crew, whose disappearance remains a mystery to this day. One suggests the sailors went overboard in the storm while trying to secure everything on deck, but this seems unlikely given the ship's undamaged condition. Another theory speculates that a German U-boat crew abducted the men aboard the Zabrina. This is plausible since World War I was going on, and especially since a nearby Allied vessel had recently reported seeing a U-boat in the area. Local historians uncovered records revealing that there were 23 people aboard the ship, compared to the usual six. This suggests that the British may have used the Zabrina as a Q-ship, which lured unsuspecting U-boats into combat. Perhaps this was the true nature of the voyage, and something went horribly wrong, tipping the victory in the Germans' favor. But we may never know what happened to the crew aboard the ill-fated ghost ship. What do you think happened to the crew of the Zabrina? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Photos of a Mystery Woman In 2013, a collection of private photographs dating back to World War I surfaced in northern France. A handful of the images show someone in a New Zealand lieutenant's uniform and hat standing alongside a fellow officer. Other pictures feature one man with a woman on his knee. A closer look reveals that the woman is clearly also the person wearing the lieutenant's uniform and hat in the other photos. The snapshots were taken in the yard of a house roughly 30 miles from the battlefront of the Somme. One individual featured in them turned out to be an Australian man named Captain Albert Arthur Chapman who was serving with the New Zealand military. They did not identify the woman. 
The picture left the historians baffled as they tried to figure out who she was. At first, they theorized that she may have been one of the first female military officers, but this was disproven. There were no female officers in the British or New Zealand militaries during World War I. Whoever the woman was, she was wearing someone else's uniform in the pictures. She wore a wedding ring, yet Captain Chapman returned home from the war alone and unmarried. He was never married. It's possible that she was a local French woman. And while the relationship between the pair certainly seems romantic in some images, she may have been a friend, family member, or wife of one of Chapman's fellow soldiers. The Missing Serial Killer Hungarian tinsmith Bela Kiss was well liked by his neighbors, but they weren't close. When he left the village of Sintoka to serve in the war in 1914, his reputation was in good standing. That all changed in 1916, when Bela's landlord heard he had died in the war and went over to the man's house to clean it out so he could start renting it to someone else. On the property, the landlord found seven large fuel drums. When he tried to open them, he was met with the unmistakable stench of death. Not good. He called the police in Budapest, who came to the scene and found the body of a strangled woman in one of the barrels. They found 24 bodies altogether and elsewhere throughout the property. An investigation revealed that Kiss had targeted women through local personal ads that were published in the newspaper, luring them to his house with promises of love and marriage. What detectives didn't realize at the time is that the serial killer was still very much alive and fighting on the front lines. Once he learned the authorities were hot on his trail, Kiss did everything he could to evade capture. At one point, while recovering from a battle wound at a hospital, he put a dead man's body in his bed and slipped away right as investigators were closing in. Between the chaos of war and conflicting reports of Bela's whereabouts, he became impossible to track. Many people reported seeing him in various places, including as far away as New York, where someone said that he was working as a janitor. By the time the authorities arrived in 1936 to look at the suspect, he had vanished. Nobody knows what happened to Bella Kiss, including how long he lived or what the rest of his life was like. Who fired the first shot? Many historians widely credit the Austro-Hungarians with firing the shot that officially started World War I. Someone fired a bullet at the Serbians from the gunboat Badrog on July 29, 1914. It was along the Danube River, where the restored vessel still sits today. But it's unclear who fired the war's first shot in the name of the British Empire. There are at least three contending events for the title. Military tradition holds that a cavalry drummer named Corporal E. Thomas shot the first bullet in Belgium on August 22, 1914. Thomas and his squad encountered four German cavalrymen when he fired his gun. Nobody was harmed in the skirmish. Just 10 days earlier, a West African soldier serving in the British military named Alhaji Grunchi fired at German forces in Togo, where they were protecting a wireless communication station. The Australians may also have a valid case for claiming that they fired the first shot on behalf of the British. On August 5, 1914, a crew led by artillery sergeant John Perdue shot at the German vessel SS Faltz in waters just south of Melbourne. The ship was trying to slip out of port unnoticed the day after Britain declared war on Germany when the firing occurred. It continued trying to sail away even after the Australian battery fired warning shots and the crew took it back to the bay under the watch of an armed guard. Disappearance of the USS Cyclops Built for the US Navy several years before World War I, the Navy had the USS Cyclops, originally designed as a bulk coal carrier called a collier. At nearly 550 feet long, it was the Navy's largest and fastest fuel ship at the time. Outfitted with 50 caliber guns, the Cyclops carried medical staff and supplies to a French hospital during the war. After the conflict, it began shuttling cargo back and forth from Brazil. On February 15, 1918, the ship left Rio de Janeiro with a load of manganese ore. It was originally heading for Baltimore, but the captain requested a detour to Barbados, citing engine problems, possibly because of too much cargo. Nobody ever saw or heard from the Cyclops again after leaving Barbados for the US. All 309 people on board vanished along with it, without even sending an SOS. A massive search effort ensued, 
but the vessel remains missing to this day. No evidence of what might have happened to it was ever found, including no debris or oil slick. The disappearance of the people aboard is the greatest non-combat loss of lives in U.S. Navy history. There are many long-held theories about what may have caused the Cyclops to vanish into thin air, including ideas pointing toward the Bermuda Triangle, German spies, aliens from outer space, and sea monsters as possible culprits. People were also quick to blame the captain, George W. Worley, who was allegedly a drunk and in no suitable position to command a ship. It's also possible that the crew encountered mechanical failures, that they were unfamiliar with how to handle the ship with its heavy load of manganese ore, a material used in steel production that the vessel rarely transports. To this day, the disappearance of the USS Cyclops is considered one of the most baffling military mysteries of all time. Who was the artist J.M.? Throughout 1917 and 1918, a British soldier created sketches and watercolor images of the heartbreaking and brutal scenes he encountered on the battlefield in France and Belgium. He wrote a note dedicating his sketchbook to his daughter Adele on the first page and used the initials J.M. The depictions are quite moving. One black and white sketch entitled Gas in the Lines shows the devastating effects that gas attacks had on horses along the front lines. Others feature destroyed towns filled with freshly dug graves and exhausted nurses surrounded by smoke and rubble. The sketchbook contains a piece of art dating from 1920, showing that J.M. survived the war. At some point, most likely during the 1960s, the man's artwork ended up at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. But nobody knows how it got there, who brought it there, or who J.M. even was. A record search yielded no results connecting anyone to the sketchbooks. 100 years after the war started, researchers were still trying to figure out who created the images. The university posted the talented soldiers' renderings online and dedicated an on-site exhibit to them in 2014. They hoped that someone would recognize the artwork and offer information about J.M.'s life. Obtaining some biographical information would help to better understand the stories behind the images and bring them even more to life. But the mystery has yet to be solved. Nurse Margaret Mall. In 2013, staff members at Aberte University in Scotland discovered an old suitcase inside a cupboard in the college's psychology department. It was filled with World War I memorabilia belonging to a nurse named Margaret Mall, including photos, letters, newspaper articles, syringes, and other medical equipment. Based on the items inside and what records are available, it appears as though she tended to badly wounded German soldiers in Kent and British soldiers in Glasgow. Margaret received letters from British, German, and French soldiers thanking her for saving their lives and lifting their spirits. Her compassion shows that she saw these injured men as humans above all, regardless of which country they served in the war. She retired in 1969 at the age of 82, after working as a nurse for 52 years. Aside from all this, nobody seems to know who Margaret was, or how her suitcase ended up at Aberte University. Researchers appeal to the public for information about the woman, hoping someone comes forward and can tell them more about her fascinating life. Who killed John Parr? John Parr was 14 years old when he joined the British Army in 1912 claiming that he was 18 to meet the minimum age requirement. It seems that at that time, nobody was looking too closely. The enemy shot the young man and killed him near the Belgian city of Mons in 1914 while scouting for the advancing Germans on his bicycle. He was just 16 years old, and experts agree he was likely to be the first British soldier killed in World War I. At first, Parr's fellow troops didn't notice the Germans had shot him. He had simply gone missing. To make things even weirder, the British military claimed that Parr was still alive for several months before finally conceding that he was dead. One of the young man's companions claimed the pair had encountered a German unit that had opened fire on them. The Germans supposedly retrieved and buried Parr's body. But the story just doesn't add up, especially since the Germans were still outside the area. There are also no known records of the skirmish, showing that it never happened. Friendly fire may have killed Parr in a case of mistaken identity, but his manner of death is a mystery that nobody will probably ever solve. A fallen soldier's mother appealed to the military for answers several times, but she never got the closure she was looking for. Plot to kidnap the Pope The Vatican began openly condemning Adolf Hitler in 1943. 
It was around this time a former Nazi general later claimed that he was tasked with kidnapping the Pope. The allegation came to light during the 1970s when former SS General Karl Wolf said that Hitler had ordered him to occupy the Vatican, take possession of its records and treasures, and relocate the Pope up north to avoid having him fall into Allied hands. There are conflicting opinions on whether any of this is true. Former Washington Post correspondent Dan Kurzman claimed in his 2007 book about the topic that the interviews he had conducted with Germans and Vatican officials, including Karl Wolf, left little doubt that the kidnapping plot was serious. He acknowledged that there are no German documents referring to it and said that this is because Hitler prohibited any details of the plot from being put into writing. British journalist John Cornwall also believed that the conspiracy was real and that Wolf managed to get Hitler to drop the plan. Others are less convinced, including historians David Alvarez and Robert Graham, who describe the evidence of the supposed planned kidnapping as mixed at best. They further pointed out that the operation would have outraged Catholics worldwide, including in the majority Catholic nations that the Nazis had taken control over. Historian Owen Chadwick thinks that by all appearances, both the Germans and the Allies had agreed to keep their hands off the Vatican, and in Chadwick's opinion, a kidnapping was incredibly unlikely. What do you think about all this? Let me know in the comments below. Operation Pastorius Part of Hitler's master plan for world domination involved taking over the United States. He hoped to do this by sabotaging the country from the inside. One of his plots, known as Operation Pastorius, would target several major American economic targets, including hydroelectric plants at Niagara Falls, aluminum plants in several states, the Horseshoe Curve Railroad Pass in Pennsylvania, Hellgate Bridge in New York, and numerous other factories, plants, and transit facilities. In June 1942, eight agents were given fake identity documents along with $175,000 in cash and instructed to blow up the targets. They were loaded onto U-boats and took off toward America's east coast. One party landed in Amagansett in New York and took the Long Island Railroad into Manhattan. By then, they had caught the attention of the authorities and a manhunt was underway. The other party landed near Jacksonville, Florida. Two of the men in New York, George Dash and Ernst Berger agreed that they had come to the United States with plans to defect and that they hated Nazism. They turned themselves in to the FBI, and the other six conspirators were soon caught. Berger received life in prison, Dash was sentenced to 30 years, and the six others were executed in the electric chair just weeks after the failed operation would have been carried out. Expedition to Antarctica Conspiracy theories about the Nazis in Antarctica have increasingly gained traction in recent years. One tale tells of a secret base the size of a small city, known as Base 22, or New Berlin, which was allegedly used by both the Nazis and the Illuminati. The alleged clandestine facility supposedly centered around the development of sophisticated technology and superweapons based on Nazi encounters with advanced extraterrestrials. Some even claim that the base still operates today, and that the Nazis, the Illuminati, and their helpers from outer space plan to launch a new world order. While these claims are more than doubtful, the Nazis did set their sights on Antarctica at one point. As the party gained power throughout the 1930s, it sent an expedition to Antarctica to survey the area and claim part of it for themselves. One of their goals was to develop alternatives to imported oil and fat-based products like butter, cream, milk, lard, margarine, and candles, so that they were prepared if Germany was cut off from trade during the war. As a main ingredient of margarine at the time, whale oil appealed to the Nazis as a potentially valuable resource. Until then, the Germans had been buying whale oil from Norway, but they no longer wanted to give the country their business. So they built whaling ships and headed south toward Antarctica in 1938. Their intended destination was an area now known as Dronning Maudland, but the Norwegians beat them there and claimed ownership of the region in early 1939. Of course, the Nazis disputed this. They named the area Neuschwabenland and made plans to go back at least two times. But these return voyages never happened due to the escalating warfare between the Allied and Axis powers. It's believed the Germans planned to build a base there, but most mainstream experts say that this never happened, despite the ongoing rumors about Base 22. The claim to Antarctica was abandoned in 1945, and there are no signs that they traveled there after their initial expedition. 
Do you believe the Nazis could have built a secret base in Antarctica? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Expedition to Tibet In early 1939, a five-member Nazi team traveled to Tibet under the orders of Heimlich Himmler to search for the origins of the so-called Aryan race. They were looking for one of the places where people of the purest blood supposedly went after the mythical island of Atlantis sank. According to subscribers of the outlandish theory, evidence of this imaginary group would most likely be found in the Himalayan region, ultimately bringing the team to the city of Lhasa. Unaware of the deluded belief system that had motivated the mission, locals welcomed the men and treated them well. The team went on to closely examine the Tibetans, taking thousands of photos, making casts of their body parts, measuring their skulls and facial features, and taking thousands of artifacts. But the trip was cut short when the war broke out, and the team returned to Germany. Zoologist Ernst Schaefer kept the information and objects gathered on the trip at his home in Salzburg, but the collection was destroyed by the time the Allies raided the property in 1945. Operation Werewolf Toward the end of World War II, the Nazis made a last-ditch effort to create a resistance force that would operate secretly behind enemy lines. Codenamed Operation Werewolf, this elite regiment of volunteers didn't fight in plain clothes or disguise as many have mistakenly believed. They were uniformed soldiers who were meant to operate similarly to Allied commandos. The organization was headquartered in Berlin, and the plan was to train recruits in guerrilla warfare tactics that the Nazis had observed among the Soviets in some of their captured territories, including Ukraine. But things didn't go according to plan. Shortly after the Allied invasion of Normandy in 1944, rumors began to circulate about a secret Nazi guerrilla force. The following year, the notorious politician Joseph Goebbels urged every German to fight to the death in what became known as the werewolf speech. Little did the world know, the werewolf unit had already been partially dismantled by then. Propaganda nevertheless continued to spread primarily through a radio station called Radio Werewolf, which claimed the Allies were planning to enslave Germans. The broadcast called on civilians to stand their ground, even if it came at the expense of their lives. After the war, German officers admitted that the werewolf unit was insufficient and weak, and that its leader, Hans Adolf Prutzmann, was equally incompetent. In other words, the regiment wasn't nearly what it was chalked up to be, and it was a non-threat from the beginning. Operation Greif At the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge in late 1944, Hitler commissioned commando leader Otto Skorzeny to run interference and sabotage Allied communications and morale. Codenamed Operation Greif, the mission involved disguising English-speaking Germans in uniforms from captured American soldiers and sending them behind enemy lines with forged U.S. Army documents. These undercover troops misdirected tank traffic, switched road signs around, destroyed ammunition dumps, destroyed telephone lines, and basically wreaked havoc on Allied operations. Luckily for the Allies, these commandos didn't cause any serious damage, but they did manage to spark some serious confusion and panic among U.S. forces. American soldiers caught on to the scheme and spread the word to be on the lookout for the culprits. They set up road checkpoints and quizzed those passing through on American sports and pop culture. Sadly, this led to the detention of genuine Allied troops. To add to the chaos, any imposters who were captured tried to throw off the Americans by claiming that commandos were plotting to kill General Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was put into protective housing out of a concern for his safety. In the end, Operation Greif did little more than inconvenience the Allied war effort. With the operation at a standstill, the Nazis withdrew the commandos. U.S. forces continued to search for the imposters for several months before realizing that they were already gone. Salon Kitty Salon Kitty first opened as a high-end brothel in an upscale section of Berlin. In 1939, it became a Nazi-run business that the Germans used to spy on their own high-ranking members. The owner, Katharina Zamet, had tried fleeing to the Netherlands in 1938, but was stopped at the border. She was forced to meet with a Nazi intelligence agent named Walter Schellenberg, who had collaborated with one of his colleagues to use the brothel for spying purposes. They gave Zamet two choices, cooperate or go to a concentration camp. She continued running the business mostly as usual, but took on 20 extra workers who she was told to assign specifically to certain Nazi customers. There were also microphones installed all over the place, along with a listening room in the basement. 
Meanwhile, Schellenberg's team arrested prostitutes all over the city and handpicked 20 of the most attractive women for the job at Kitty's. The team also recruited through Nazi administrative offices. Starting in 1940, the women took Nazi customers into their rooms and got them to loosen up with some alcohol and some fun. The extent of the information gleaned from the operation is unknown because records are scarce, but it seems as though nothing too promising came of it. By the time the British destroyed the building during an air raid in 1942, the project had been abandoned for its lack of usefulness. Operation Lena The Nazis' planned invasion of Britain, codenamed Operation Celion, was put on hold after a large amount of Luftwaffe planes were shot down during the Battle of Britain. But Hitler decided to go ahead with part of the invasion plan, known as Operation Lena. The project involved infiltrating Britain with Nazi-trained secret agents to carry out espionage and sabotage missions. A diverse array of English-speaking men and a few women were chosen, including recruits from Germany, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Cuba, Ireland, and Britain. They were dropped by parachute into remote parts of Ireland and England and transported near the coast by submarine, then paddled to an isolated beach on a dinghy. Their next step was to find somewhere to lay low and await orders from their commander. The agents were then tasked with arranging parachute drops of explosives and sabotage equipment, which they would use to blow up airfields, power stations, and aircraft factories. They were also directed to attack Buckingham Palace and poison the water supply. British authorities kept any knowledge of the operation secret from the public, and it wasn't until years later that historians learned about it through freedom of information laws. As it turns out, many of the agents quickly turned themselves in, claiming that they had only accepted the mission as a way to escape from the Nazis. Others were captured within days when locals noticed out-of-place individuals behaving strangely and reported them. British counterintelligence was one step ahead of the Nazis in several ways. For example, a Welsh policeman volunteered to help the Germans in exchange for securing the independence of Wales. Little did the Nazis know, he was working for the British intelligence agency MI5 and reporting back about everything he learned, which helped lead to the capture of the other agents. Operation Eiche By the time Allied forces invaded Italy in 1943, much of the country saw itself as having lost the war. The citizens voted their fascist and pro-Nazi leader Benito Mussolini out of power, and the king arrested him. This troubled Adolf Hitler, who believed that maintaining Mussolini's power was necessary for keeping Italy's support in the war. He wasn't wrong. By then, Italy had already agreed to participate in secret peace talks with the Allies. Hitler invaded northern Italy, splitting the country in two, and began his mission to rescue Mussolini. In a mission codenamed Operation Eicha, that later became known as the Grand Sasso Raid, Hitler ordered Waffen-SS officer Otto Skorzeny to free Mussolini before he was turned over to the Allies. Skorzeny traced the disgraced dictator's whereabouts to a remote ski resort in the Apennine Mountains. He traveled there on gliders with a team of 16 SS troopers, approaching silently before they stormed the property. The intruders overwhelmed the guards with ease and destroyed their radio equipment. They then located Mussolini, who reportedly exclaimed, I knew my friend Adolf Hitler would not leave me in the lurch. Skorzeny rushed to get him aboard a plane and personally escorted him to Austria. Not a single bullet was fired throughout the entire raid, which was carried out in less than 10 minutes. Mussolini went on to lead a puppet government that the Nazis set up in northern Italy. By early 1945, he realized that the Allies were gaining the upper hand on the Italian peninsula. Not wanting to fall into American or British custody or be tried as a war criminal in his own country, Mussolini and his mistress, Clara Petacci, attempted to flee to neutral Switzerland. They encountered partisan forces at the border and were shot dead. Italian authorities made an example out of them by displaying their bodies in the streets of Milan. Rudolf Hess Rudolf Hess was one of Hitler's apostles of evil, appointed deputy Führer in 1933. He held his position as one of Hitler's top men up until something very strange happened in 1941. For an unknown reason, Rudolf parachuted alone into the United Kingdom and landed in Scotland. He claimed it was because he wanted to negotiate the exit of the UK from World War II, but nobody believed him. He was swiftly taken prisoner and convicted of crimes against the peace, and in the end, he was ordered to serve a life sentence. He spent the rest of his days in jail and died in 1987. 
In the decades leading up to the war, Rudolf was one of Hitler's greatest allies. He was with Hitler in November of 1923, when the Nazis attempted to gain control over the government in Bavaria. This was known as the Beer Hall Putsch, and it landed Hitler and his associates in prison. Rudolf was right there at his side again in 1933, when Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. And this is where the truly evil part of Rudolf's life began. He wasn't only the third in line to succeed Hitler if he died, he was also the man responsible for signing many of the laws which would strip Jewish citizens living in Germany of their rights. He signed the Nuremberg Laws, enacted on September 15, 1935. This newly passed legislation banned marriage between Germans and Jews, and their citizenship rights were taken away, basically turning them into cattle. These laws helped Germany enforce racism, and things only got worse from here. Hitler's Personal Staff It's hard to say for certain just how evil Hitler's personal staff was. There was the scientists, the officers, and the military experts who all helped the war efforts and committed atrocities. However, there was also Hitler's personal staff, men like his aides and adjutants, basically his henchmen that did whatever he asked. Hitler maintained a large group of personal assistants, primarily high-ranking or senior military, police, and government men. He was also surrounded by the upper management of human resources in the army and other people of that nature. These were the men who kept the wheels of the Third Reich spinning. Their names are not widely known, but they were the bureaucrats responsible for keeping Hitler's war machine well-oiled. Without them, the war would have been lost before it started. Hitler also had a large group of people who waited on him hand and foot, like a medieval king. He had valets, men who accompanied him on his travels and drove him places. He also had people in charge of his daily routine. Somebody would wake him up, and another person would provide him with a newspaper. His personal staff would even determine what he would wear, and they would help with other simple things most people can do for themselves. Once Hitler found someone that was completely loyal to him, he would keep them around. The man hated change, and he liked to know the people working for him and their habits. Many of his secretaries, chauffeurs, and valets were present in the Führer bunker at the end of the war when Hitler died. Werner von Braun Werner von Braun went from being Hitler's personal mad scientist to the NASA genius behind the Apollo 8 mission that went to the moon in 1968. On behalf of Nazi Germany, he used slave labor from the Mittelbau Dora concentration camp for his production of the devastating V-2 ballistic missile. Von Braun went from working in a factory of Holocaust victims to managing the production of the Saturn V moon rocket for the United States of America. But how did this happen, and just how evil was Werner von Braun? We know that as a young man, von Braun worked on the rocket development program for Nazi Germany. But after the war, when the United States secretly moved about 1,600 German scientists and engineers to the USA, von Braun got a free pass. It was all part of Operation Paperclip, the US's plot to steal as many skilled German scientists as they could before the Soviets got a hold of them. Werner von Braun worked on intermediate-range ballistic missiles. He was responsible for developing the very first rockets that launched the US space satellites, the Explorer 1, into orbit in 1958. He even worked with Walt Disney on some films in the late 1950s. He was then assimilated into NASA in 1960, where he became the chief architect of the Saturn V. It's unclear just how evil the scientist was, but he was complicit in Nazi Germany and did design rockets that killed a lot of people. He also helped come up with the idea for space rockets, missiles that could be equipped to a space station orbiting the planet and could be launched at any target. Walter Funk Walter Funk was the president of the Reichsbank in Nazi Germany. He was one of the worst contributors to the Holocaust right alongside Hitler. However, he wasn't a brilliant scientist or a violent military commander. Walter was a businessman, and he used his position as the president of the National Bank in Germany to hurt the Jewish people in whichever way he could. Particularly, he concentrated his effort on pushing German Jews out of the economy. He played a critical role in making sure that, when the time came, the Jewish people found themselves penniless. Then, when the Holocaust began, Walter helped recycle confiscated property from Jewish citizens. This means he took the valuables stolen from Jews 
and sold them to make a profit and to help the German war economy. He also siphoned financial assets from Holocaust victims into Germany's collective treasury. Volta wasn't able to escape Germany at the end of the war. He was captured and tried for crimes against humanity. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He would be released in 1957 due to poor health, but just three short years later, he died in 1960. Theodore Morel Theodore Morel was kind of like Hitler's right-hand man. He would accompany Hitler into his meetings as well as every bunker he entered, and he would even follow him into his bedchamber at night. Theodore may have been considered Hitler's most important ally during the war. This is because he was appointed to be Hitler's personal doctor, the man who needed to be there to administer the leader of Nazi Germany's daily injections. As you may know already, Nazi Germany was blasted on legal crystal meth. Everyone from the taxi drivers to the businessmen, and especially the soldiers, were taking pills called pervitin. These pills were basically speed, something illegal today but readily available in the 1930s and 40s. It was part of a plan thought up by the heads of the Nazi party to push the German people into overtime, thereby helping the nation win the war. It was also used on soldiers to make them feel invincible, even if it did drive many of them into psychosis. But let's get back to Dr. Theodore Morell, the apostle of evil who helped melt Hitler's brain. Hitler was bad enough already, but by the end of the war he was on roughly 80 different drugs administered solely by Theodore. Historians have called the doctor a brazen opportunist, saying he wormed his way into the Nazi party. Once he was at Hitler's side, he filled him with enough drugs to make him dependent on them. Many believe Theodore administered so many drugs to Hitler that the Fuhrer went partially insane, which led to some of his outrageous decisions near the end of the war. Heinrich Himmler Heinrich Himmler was the leader of the SS from between 1929 and 1945. Hitler may have been the man in charge, but Heinrich was pulling the strings. He was behind much of the ideology and bureaucracy of the Third Reich, and he was considered to be the second in command next to Hitler. However, it was Heinrich who came up with and implemented the final solution. This wasn't merely Hitler's plan. It was the Nazi party's plan to murder every Jewish person in Europe, and Heinrich tried to see it through to the end with great enthusiasm. When Heinrich was put in charge of the SS in 1929, he had 280 men under him, mostly bodyguards for Hitler and other Nazi leaders. By January of 1933, Heinrich grew their numbers to more than 52,000 men. The SS secret police became more of a death cult and were some of the most feared members of the Nazi party in Europe. Heinrich Himmler committed many atrocities, but his biggest crime was definitely the Holocaust. He centralized the concentration camp system and slaughtered human beings at an unprecedented rate. There were only four concentration camps in 1937, but by the time everything was said and done, there were about 40 main camps and hundreds of subcamps. Camp authorities would kill roughly 2 million prisoners before the war was over, primarily Jews, Roma or Gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others seen as asocial. When it was clear Germany had lost the war, Heinrich tried to flee, but he was captured by Russian soldiers and was consequently handed over to the British. In the end, he avoided punishment when he bit down on a cyanide capsule on May 23, 1945. Erich Raeder Erich Raeder was one of the men held accountable in the aftermath of the Holocaust. The International Military Tribunal, IMT, which was held in Nuremberg, Germany, brought charges against him on October 18, 1945. Erich Raeder, Walter Funk, and over 20 more German officers were tried for their crimes against humanity. Erich was found guilty of the crime of conspiracy, crimes against peace, and multiple war crimes. He too was sentenced to life in prison, but he was released in 1955 because of his poor health. But before he was an old man dying in a jail cell, Erich was the Grand Admiral of the German Navy. He played a critical role in the war itself, and held highest possible naval rank in 1939 when he led the Nazi forces against the world for the first half of the war. He fought in World War I as well, so he was already very experienced. 
After the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, Erich Raeder pleaded with Hitler to immediately declare war on the US and attack the East Coast. As you can tell, Erich was a serious warmonger. Why do you think Rudolf Hess really parachuted into the UK alone? Let us know what you think in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe! Karl Dunitz Hitler was not the last dictator of Germany. After he was pronounced dead, another man took his place, albeit very briefly. His name was Karl Dunitz, and most people have never heard of him before. He was a naval officer and a devoted Nazi who took over command of Germany's navy from Erich Raeder in 1943. Even as the war was reaching its peak, Karl continued ordering U-boats to kill and pillage to the bitter end. On April 29, 1945, Hitler declared Karl Dunitz the next head of state and the commander of the German armed forces upon his death. Hitler was already planning how he would put an end to himself and Eva Braun in order to avoid the dishonor of his inevitable surrender. On the 29th, the Russian soldiers were only a few blocks from the Fuhrer bunker. The next day he was dead and Karl was the new Fuhrer. Karl tried to get in control of the situation, but Germany was collapsing too fast. Nobody felt any loyalty to him, and Germans were surrendering in the masses. At the same time, Karl was desperately trying to negotiate a partial peace with the UK and US. And yet, even in the face of helpless defeat, Karl ordered all German forces to continue fighting. The war was coming to an end, but Karl continued to push the Germans to their unnecessary deaths. As a result, Karl was deposed and arrested. He sat in a jail for 10 years and was released in 1956. He then retired to a small village in West Germany and lived peacefully until 1980 when he died at 89 years old. Martin Bormann Martin Bormann was Hitler's private secretary. He was the man responsible for the flow of information and access to Adolf Hitler throughout the war. He used this position of power to insert himself into as much bureaucracy and decision-making as possible. It was an extraordinary promotion from his previous job in the Nazi party, working in insurance service. He clawed his way through the bureaucratic labyrinth until he finally got to Hitler's side on August 12, 1935. Martin Bormann was a particularly cruel man. He's most famous today for being one of the leaders behind the persecution of Christian churches and for his encouragement of treating Jews and Slavs harshly in Europe. He used his power to cause as much anguish and suffering to the minorities as humanly possible throughout the war. Martin returned to the Fuhrer bunker in 1945 with Hitler, but after the dictator's death, Martin tried desperately to flee Berlin and escape the Soviets. It's not exactly clear what happened, only that his body was found near Leiter Station on a bridge in May of 1945. The bones weren't identified as Martin's until 1973, and in 1998, a DNA test confirmed the remains belonged to him. And even though he was already dead, before his body was discovered, Bormann was convicted of crimes against humanity in 1945 and was sentenced to death. Joseph Goebbels Joseph Goebbels was arguably one of the worst masterminds of evil in Hitler's inner circle. He regulated all content of German media and was directly responsible for instigating anti-Semitism in Germany. He also forced many Jewish people into unemployment before the Holocaust began and even staged book burnings. He was behind Nazi propaganda films and was the main driving force behind stirring up a national hatred for the Jewish people in the 1930s. He became the Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda in 1933 and was a trusted colleague and friend of Hitler himself. Joseph Goebbels was the mastermind behind many of the false stereotypes about Jewish people. He made feature films such as The Eternal Jew and Jude Sus, both of which perpetuated the idea that Jewish people are greedy. He made movie after movie in order to get the German people irritated with Jews and to make them feel more patriotic. His entire job was to dehumanize the Jews, making it easier for German citizens to accept what was happening. Joseph also went out like a coward with Hitler and many of the other top commanders. But Joseph took things even further. The day after Hitler died, he technically replaced him as the German Chancellor. However, that same day he and his wife went home and fatally poisoned all six of their children. Then the couple ended their own lives. What are your thoughts on Hitler's apostles of evil? 
Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.